Hi, I'm Father Daniel Duplantis. In the 20th century, a new movement from the Far East captured the Western mind. Since then, the intersection of Christianity and martial arts has generated both conflict and harmony. In between, there remains many gray areas. In my new book, Jesus in the Dojo, I combine timeless theology with modern catechesis to provide a clearer path of reconciliation between the Christian faith and the practice of martial arts. You can find my book, Jesus in the Dojo, available now at most booksellers. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi, Father Dan. Welcome back to the Quest podcast. Hey, Todd. Great to be back. Yeah, this is uh, the sixth season, and I think you've been on at least four of these. <laughs> you know, it's it's incredible to think, you know, um, how many times we've done this now, and and not even on just you, your podcast, but also with mine, and you know, the fact that this all really started uh, a little over three years ago. I remember it was, um, I think, November or December of twenty twenty uh, when we first met through this business. So I yeah, think so. Incredible. I think so. Yeah, it's been a while, and I loved it. It's been a great relationship. And, you know, we're on a break right now from your podcast. I don't think we're going to have Karate Priest back until maybe the summer at the soonest. But let's tell everyone why we're on break, because you and I haven't caught up since you've moved to Alaska. Yeah, that's that's kind of been the big rock. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I finally went active duty as an Air Force chaplain. Um, and so uh, and I'll put the you know normal disclaimer, as I usually do, that since I'm active duty and uh, currently serving in uniform that, um, none of my stuff, nothing that I say, uh, is endorsed anyway by the DOD or the U S air force. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been the big thing is, um, you know, I got assigned to, uh, joint base Elmendorf Richardson in Anchorage. Uh, and so I moved here back in August and, uh, you know, I'll be here for quite a bit and, um, yeah, that was the big move. And so, um, you know, still settling in, in a way, still, um, you know, a lot of unpacking still to do. Um, because, uh, we've had renovations and things like that. So I haven't even moved into my permanent office yet. So I still have lots of boxes waiting to be moved, um, into the office and, you know, so, yeah. It was, uh, it was quite a year for you last year. Now, I know we've touched on this a couple yeah, of times when we've shown up on, on different, I, maybe your best year ever possible. You're not even 30 yet. <laughs> no, I turned 30 in May, but you're right. 2023, I think was without a doubt, you know, besides, you know, ordination, back in 2020 and 2023, I think was the year where, um, you know, I think pretty much like all my major goals happened, you know, um, considering that, you know, in April, uh, we released my first book, um, and then, uh, got my fourth degree master belt in Taekwondo in June, moved to Alaska, went active duty in August, um, got another black belt promotion for Tang Sudo, uh, to third degree back in, I think it was, uh, November, you know, so, um, met the president met the, yeah, you're right. Met the president. How can I forget that? Yeah. Labor day <laughs> got to meet the president, um, and actually pray over him and got a super sweet picture, um, doing that. Like I need to get that frame because, you know, just whether you like him or you hate him, you know, uh, any chaplain that gets to like straight up pray over the president like that, that doesn't happen often at all. So and that was on nine 11. Um, that was, that was, that was nine yeah. 11. That was a Memorial Day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. The nine 11 Memorial. Um, and so, uh, that was literally within a month of me going on active duty. And I was like, wow, you know, for me to get that opportunity right out the gate, um, you know, you and I would, we would exchange texts and we would joke and I would be like, well, it's probably going to be, you know, you, you know, smooth rest of the year, nothing big happened. And then something big would happen. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Something would happen. like, oh, you know, especially, yeah, after the black belt test, because that had been on the calendar for a while too, after the book and my, uh, my master's test. Um, I was like, okay, well, what else big can happen this year besides you know moving to Alaska? Well, then, bam, meet the president, bam, Tang Sudo promotion, um, and uh, I don't know if I told you this yet. I do have um, another title that I've uh, I'll be adding this year. Is that is that uncle? 
It is uncle. Yes. My <laughs> sister and my brother-in-law are pregnant with their first. And so we don't know uh, if it's a boy or a girl yet, um, but I will be adding uh, uncle to my list of titles this year. So I'm super excited about that. Normally when you hear the term uncle, it's because you're choking someone out and they're going uncle, uncle. <laughs> and now you get to use it in a whole different, <laughs> a whole yes. different way. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, and of course this year I'm already, you know, hoping we have, I, I don't know if we can top last year, but I'm still hoping we can top something. So we're about to start recording the audio book of Jesus in the Dojo which I think will be exciting for a new group of listeners. So I, you'll be starting that pretty soon. And we're also looking to translate your book into Spanish, which would be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, it's still amazing to think that, you know, um, but yeah, you know, it, it's amazing when you, you think of, um, you know, in, in the last couple of years, as I've kind of gotten more into networking in the martial arts community, um, just seeing how many, um, whether just here in the United States or even, you know, in, in Central and South America, uh, how many martial arts schools there are here in the Americas. Uh, that Spanish translation, I think, is going to do really well, also considering that Central and South America are extremely Catholic places. For sure. And you know there's kids enrolled in martial arts there, so. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so we have an exciting six months, and for those that are waiting for season three of the Karate Priest, you might have a little bit longer of a wait uh, to the summer, maybe, or even to the fall, but we are quite busy on things behind the scenes for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Let's lots going on, you know, so once the dust settles, we'll hopefully be able to get back into it, but certainly, you know, th doing these guest episodes <laughs> helps keep well, me fresh, helps keep me in the game. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so I figured we would catch up with just some stories that maybe would be interesting to touch on that happened over the last six months or so. So we'll yeah. just get to the the top headline making story right now, probably the most important thing to happen uh, to Catholics in forever. Uh, Shia LaBeouf is turning Catholic. <laughs> yeah. And he actually yeah. just confirmed. So he became fully initiated into the Catholic church for new years. He was confirmed yeah. by a Bishop. Um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name for right now. Um, Robert Barron. Yeah. Shia LaBeouf was a child star who was fairly troubled for a while in his teens and his twenties. And uh, a lot of people thought he might become a casualty like a lot of child stars are. He was really going off the rails and working on um, this biopic movie that he's doing on uh, Padre Pio kind of changed his perspective. And I think in a, a way Catholicism has, has saved him. Do you want to comment on that maybe? Yeah. And, 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 you know, to start with that, like, you know, Shia LaBeouf was a name that I knew since I was a kid um, and because, you know, he was on like even Stevens yeah. on the Disney channel. Um, he starred in holes, which was a huge movie. Cause I was in third grade, I think, or something around that when holes came out third or fourth grade. Um, so this is like 20 years ago. Um, and love that movie. Every single teacher in my school, like showed that movie to their classes because a lot of us read the novels in school. Um, you know, so I knew him from those and, and, you know, a couple of other different, you know, movies he was in. Um, and Transformers. so uh, he was in Transformers. He was in Fury. That um, terrible and, Indiana Jones movie he did. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Mutt Williams. Crystal, Crystal Skull. Played, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so yeah, he's certainly a name that I I, I knew and, and had watched growing up. Um, and so, um, but it was really the process for his preparation to portray Padre Pia, which you could definitely see the resemblance, yeah. you know, between him and the original Pio. Um the real life Padre Pio. And it, it was the preparation because to prepare for taking on that role, um, he actually lived with a bunch of Capuchin friars, um, you know, in the, the order that Padre Pio was. And so um, by immersing himself in that life, you know, I imagine uh, it was where the conversion happened, you know, uh, because he was immersed in their prayer, in their routine, their way of life. Um, especially because these Capuchins, you know, are definitely a, a communal uh, order. Um, and so uh, almost like a hybrid, you know, I would imagine between like, you know, um, Franciscans, as many of them are known as, as preaching, you know, who tend to get out, but also in this sense, maybe somewhat cloistered, semi-cloistered, if anything, um, because you can tell that the Capuchins, like they live together, they do a lot of things together. Um, and so there is this great sense of community there. But so he was immersed in that. He was immersed in their life. Um, their prayers, their routines, the works that they do day in, day out, all their various ministries, you know, 
all this to take on the character. Uh, but it sounds like he took on more than the character. It sounds like he has taken on the faith of that character. For sure. I think maybe on some level, he probably needed some form of discipline or some kind of accountability um, in his life because a lot of celebrities, when they get the excess, they, you know, they feel they can do anything. Celebrities will feel they're above the law or they can buy anything or have anything that they want. <laughs> and uh, bad things happen when you indulge in things like that. Yeah, you know, in, in, in going and living with the Friars, um, you know, I, I, there's always there's a, a stark contrast there because you think of Hollywood and perhaps the um, the moral license uh, that Hollywood tends to, to give to a lot of people where they think they can just do anything, be who they want, be what they want, do whatever they want to do uh, with little to no consequence. And then they realize that to have the world at your fingertips isn't fulfilling, Yeah, you know. And then to go to a place like he did to immerse himself in the life of these Franciscans who have given up their own desires, who have given up everything. The only desire they have is to, is, is to serve Christ and, and to do that in the vocation to which they were called. It's such a radical difference. And But to be removed from the world, to live in that environment, and to, to be with people who their only fulfillment in this life is simply to live for God, like that's going to put things in an echo chamber. You know, and that's where I think the you know like the experience that happened for Shia comes about. You know, and certainly for me, you know, I went to college seminary at a Benedictine monastery, and there's just something about monasteries, you know, where you you get away from the rest of the world. That's the point. Monasteries are often built and founded in very secluded places, yeah, because it's a place to get away from the world and people to live. They, you know, the monks who who take these vows, um take the vows to live away from the world, but to pray for the world um, right. and, and to p really purify their prayer um, removed from the place that needs it. You know, so it, yeah. it is a yeah. very incredible lifestyle uh, to see religious like the Franciscans and the Benedictines. He plays a uh, Padre Pio in this movie. And I was reading up about Padre Pio and we actually were recording a no earthly explanation just before this recording for quest. <clears throat> And uh, you talked a little bit about uh, Padre Pio in that. And I thought it was interesting what I read about him. Um, but, you know, he had stigmata. So he had wounds on his hands and his feet. I can't remember what what they were. They, he had these, but these were, um, he had these pretty much his whole life. But uh, I wasn't, and I don't want to get into that in this. You can go over to No Earthly Explanation and you can hear all this being talked about on that, on that show. But I, I saw the term mystic when they referred to Padre Pio. And I wasn't familiar with that term. What is a mystic in Catholicism? A mystic is, a lot of time we use it to describe a person, um, especially with, with a particular, I guess, spirituality. One who spends so much time, you know, in prayer, really meditating, going very deeply into the mysteries of Christ and his life. Um, and to the point where they become so immersed in, in the life of Christ, where they're able to, so a lot of them take on these different um, uh, abilities and miracles that there's no, <laughs> this will be a, a clip, so for no, no earthly explanation, um, because a lot of mystics are known for things like levitation, mm -hmm. bilocation, uh, and certainly Padre Pio was known for these things. Padre Pio uh, also had a gift as a priest and as a confessor of being able to read people's hearts. Like if someone was holding something back in confession, he would he would know yeah and he can tell them you haven't confessed this you know it, it's these a lot of these just supernatural abilities um and again and it's all attributed really to to christ himself you know uh for the building up of the kingdom for for ministry you know um some of the bilocation stories have to do with he's praying in the chapel and at the same time while he's praying he's bilocated to actually help someone in need you know um Wow, And so it's, it's you know, you, you hear these stories, especially, again, about these mystics who they spend so much time uh, and, and have really dedicated their life to prayer, like Padre Pio did, um, to where um, they have these experiences and they're able to do these, these miraculous things with no earthly explanation. And, you know, he he was a he was a what he died in the 60s, I think, maybe 1968, like he. He lived a long time, but he was born in what, 1880 something, I think. And when the stigmata came on, some of these abilities came on, it was around World War One. So this isn't something that's, you know, 300 years ago that people are talking about. This is more of a modern occurrence, I would say. Yeah, I mean, there are people who 
who are alive today, many people who are alive today who actually met Padre Pio back in the day. It's a lot of older people, but mm -hmm. who actually like knew a time where he was alive. Um, I had met a priest a few years ago when I was doing a summer program for seminarians in Omaha, Nebraska. And one of the priests that was there, he was an old Monsignor and had concelebrated mass with Padre Pio. And it was a bunch of priests together and Padre Pio walks into the sacristy and all the other priests are like howering. Like they're, they're just nervous because they all know the stories. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said that, you know, Padre Pio had walked up to him and said, are you nervous? <laughs> Do I make you nervous? And, and that's the thing too, because this priest that, that was at this program, this guy, like he was a total, just awesome priest. Um, and, uh, and he, he looks at Padre Pio. He says, we're both priests. You're Jesus and I'm Jesus. What reason do I have to be nervous around you? So <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's like two just spiritual juggernauts, you know. Wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's just P, P. It's amazing. Padre Pio is just almost this larger than life guy who, um, so many miracles. But his life also wasn't without controversy. I mean, there's a time that because of these things happening, his stigmata, his different gifts and abilities as a mystic. Um, that the church had suppressed them for a little bit, you know, that had was because they wanted to investigate all these things. Um, and you see that happen nowadays where, you know, the church will investigate um, priests for different things. And the a lot of the reaction nowadays is um, is it's it's you see some of these priests um, who they, they try to fight it or they they they're, they're self-righteous about it. Um, but Padre Pio let it come. Because he let the truth be known, he 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 trusted, he believed in what the church stood for, especially you know in the magisterium in the institution, to trust that the institution was simply trying to figure out the truth, yeah. And so yeah. he he followed all the instructions from the Vatican, and was later cleared because it was found that everything he was doing was found to be true. Wow, that's fascinating. I hope uh, Shia brings a good performance, and this is a this is a big movie. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Um, but uh yeah, I mean it's it's for him to have that kind of reaction to it, you know. Um, yeah, there's something powerful about the character itself, and I I would hope that the movie itself is also equal. And Pio's a saint now, right? Do they has he yes. been made a saint? I believe so. If not a saint, I think he's at least a blessed, but um I want to say he is a saint. Um because he's in I know for sure he's in the Roman Missal. He has a feast day. Um Let's see, Padre Pio. I'm kind of looking it up right now. Yes, he's a venerated saint. His uh, feast day is September 23rd. Um, and I remember because in the Missal, um, his, it doesn't say Padre Pio. It says, um, um, it says like uh, Pius Pietrocina or something like that. And I was like, who is this guy? And I had to Google that. And I was like, oh, it's Padre Pio. Because everyone knows him as just Padre Pio. Right, uh, but his full name, especially in Italian, uh, is, is is a little bit different. Interesting. Well, moving on, um, the Vatican has released a lot of stuff in the last six months, and I want to kind of touch on some of this because a lot of it is controversial. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I saw just a, a few days back uh, the Pope warning about an ideological shift, this ecclesiastical ideologies. Do you want to explain? to the to listeners what that is, what that means? Yeah, I, I think what's happening right now in the church, and this, this is, I think, especially a phenomenon here in the U.S., um, is that ideology seems to drive a lot of how people see the church as opposed to being the other way around. It really needs to be the church who influences our ideology and our beliefs. But a lot of people, especially here in the U.S., we have a big problem where um, a lot of church matters are politicized much more than they need to be. And for that reason, you see a lot of sharp divides between Catholics in the U.S. And oftentimes that manifests itself in the form of um, you have uh, we call them sometimes radical traditionalists, you know, um, who uh, in, in there's varying degrees of these. In, and I'm not trying to put people in a box or to judge people, but, you know, you have people on one hand who really, really love the extraordinary form uh, in the Latin mass. Um, but sometimes it gets to an extreme where. They will say that Francis is an anti-pope or or will say that Francis is somehow, you know, uh, damaging the church. Um, there's there was a, a letter written uh, recently where someone was calling for a millstone to be tied around Francis's neck and for him to be thrown into the sea. 
you know, uh, and so like things like that wow. um, often carry like the penalty of excommunication, you know, when you're going to, to basically to wish harm on the Pope, you know. Yeah. Um, so and then on the other hand, um, you have uh, perhaps a, a much more liberal theology um, where there's, you know, there's no judgment whatsoever. But at the same time, you know, there's no call to conversion. There's no call to correction, you know. Um, and so and we're seeing that play out a lot of time in in the. I guess under the guise of American politics between conservatism and liberalism, which has really, you know, become um, so much, I guess, starker um, by contrast now than I think I've ever seen it. You know, it feels like we're becoming more and more polarized as a country. And, you know, with that, a lot of American Catholics are, are falling into that also. We're seeing that in the church globally because you see the church in Germany now who – as a nation, a lot of German Catholics in the, the German Bishops' Conference is becoming a lot more liberal, whereas a lot of places like Africa, um, the bishops there are far more conservative. And so you're seeing, um, you know, a lot of this play out in, 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 in like national bishops' conferences. Yeah. Another thing that seemed uh, fairly controversial in the last six months was uh, allowing the blessing of uh, same-sex couples. But I, I feel like that the press really just grabbed certain button words and ran with this, and there was more to it than kind of what was what was you know put out there. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and 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 you're right. I think that assessment um, <laughs> you, you you hit the nail on the head. Where they had all the buzzwords they wanted to hear in one sentence, um, but it was gravely misreported and misrepresented by most of like the major news sources because they got the buzzwords they wanted. They heard Catholic same-sex blessings, right? Um, and that's all they wanted to hear. That's all for them they, they really needed to, to try to take and run with it, you know, as if it's this radical shift in the way that, that the church does things. So if you read the actual document, the document is called um, Fiducian Supplicans or, 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 or something like that. I, I probably messed it up. But um, if you read through the entire document, first of all, I think the document is beautifully worded. Um, and, and certainly, you know, it, the document is very clear. This does not change the church's teachings on the sacrament of matrimony. We still believe that marriage is between one man and one woman for the rest of their lives together. Um, and it makes it very clear in the document that no blessing is to resemble a wedding in any form, right? Because this isn't just for same, uh, same sex couples. This also has to do with just irregular unions. You know, when you have um, someone who is previously married in the church. Um, who is civilly divorced but has not gotten an annulment, and then they've civilly remarried already. You know, same. These are irregular unions. Um, and so, is there anything wrong with a person coming and just asking a priest spontaneously for a blessing? And even if they come up as a couple, um, what's happening is you're not blessing the union; you're simply blessing them as people, as individuals. Um, you know, it's the same concept of like when people come up in the communion line. You know, and they're in a state of mortal sin, and they know they can't receive communion because they're in mortal sin, haven't been to confession yet, but they cross their arms in front of their chest, you know, and they're asking for a blessing. They're not asking us to bless their sin. They're just asking us for a blessing. They're asking that, it's, that's it's me, people. A, yeah, and, and it's, you know, and, and I love how the document says this. It's basically, it's a cry to God for help, you know. Um, and so the document is very clear. And that's why, you know, the document also says it, it, it's clear in that there is to be no right for this, no ritual, you know, um, because it's to be spontaneous. We don't want to ritualize something um, for irregular situations. So we don't want a regular prayer for an irregular union. So that's how this works, you know, and so it, it's it, and they leave it up to um, to the bishops to maybe issue more guidelines for how their priests are to do this. Um, but again, the concept is we're not blessing the unions themselves. We're just, we're blessing the people who are asking for God's help in their lives, you know. Um, and so a lot of the media, and this thing too, and this is kind of going back to like the ideology shifts and things like that, you know. Um, I think this is where this falls is you have people who kind of want to hear a particular thing in these documents, and they hear the buzzwords they want to hear, and then they kind of either you know tear into the document, or they hear the buzzwords that they that they want to hear. And then, um, and then they start saying, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. This is a radical shift in the church's teaching. And it's not, you know, yeah. the document yeah. itself says the church has not changed its teaching. It is not to be confused with any kind of blessing of the union or any kind of marriage in any way, shape or form. Um, 
the document is beautifully, beautifully written, you know, um, because this is the thing is it, 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 it allows a, a, an avenue for people who are in these unions to try to find their way back to the church. You know, yes, the church still calls to conversion, still calls for repenting of, of sins. You know, we haven't changed our stance on what is sin and what is not. But this, is, this gives an attitude for people to say, hey, at least I can come talk to the priest now and, and ask him to, to give me a blessing for God's help in my life so I can simply just live God's will, whatever that may be, you know. Um, because here's the thing. It is very hard to preach to people. It is very hard to preach repentance and conversion if they're if they feel they can't even walk through our doors. Right. Right. Because For otherwise, sure. how do we know who they are? How do we know if we're walking around, you know, grocery shopping or just walking around in our everyday lives? You know, who is in need of God's help? Sometimes it has to do with they present themselves. And they won't present themselves if they feel like there's no possibility the church is ever going to accept any part of them. Right. So again, you know, it, it's it's not that we're blessing the union, we're not blessing the sin. We simply want to pray, and they're invoking God's help on their lives to live his will. And that's really all it is. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, and it's caused such a major uproar. But, you know, I encourage people, before you ever make any statement for or against, read the document in its entirety, you know. And if you need help understanding some things, please seek someone out. Because especially part two of the document talks about the nature of blessings itself. And if you've never taken a liturgy class on blessings specifically and in the different types of blessings that there are, then it's easy to take things out of context, you know. So you need to have an understanding of the different forms of liturgical blessing before you can try to really understand the document and what it's asking for in its entirety. Where do people find things like that? If someone wanted to read this document, where would it be? Um, you can Google the names of, of specific documents and the Vatican website has all of them. Um, itself. So I'm trying to let me see if I can find the website really quick. I think it's like Vatican.va. Um, and then from there, you can navigate the website um, to find a, yeah, it's, it's the Holy See's website. And from there, um, they have um, like apostolic constitutions, they have exhortations, encyclicals, letters, messages, prayers, speeches, you name it. It is the official website for resources that come out of the Vatican. Um, so yeah, I encourage people, you know, go find the documents and, and, and read them. This may sound like a, like a dumb question maybe, but uh, you, you, these documents, when they come out, are these things that the Pope writes? Is it the Pope and a council of people that talk, talk about this or discuss this for maybe a s substantial amount of time? Like, what is that process like when documents like this are released? Depends on the type of the document. Um, you know, sometimes it is the Pope himself writing, or sometimes it's the Pope um, writing with the help of other bishops or theologians. Um, this one in particular was actually written by uh, the prefect for the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith. Um, it used to be called the CDF, the congregation. Now it's called the dicastery, so the DDF. Uh, and that's Cardinal Fernandez. Um, so Cardinal Fernandez is the one who actually like writes the document and, 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 and signs it at the end. Um, but he does this, of course, with the confirmation of the Pope, of the Holy Father, you know, um, and it's also checked by other theologians, um, you know, so it just depends. There's a couple of different ways they could write it, especially like with encyclicals. Encyclicals are always usually signed by the Pope. Um, and so a lot of it's his words, but he's doing this, you know, in collegiality with other theologians, getting ideas, phrasing things, the whole editing process, things like that. You know, um, it's never usually most time it's not just the Holy Father writing this um, by himself. You know, he's always going to ask for input from people and to check things before they're actually promulgated and published. I'm curious, uh, you know, me and, you know, putting weird uh, discussions in front of you, but I'm curious about this. Um, how, as, as a priest, maybe, uh, maybe from a church perspective, how how do Catholics deal with people with identity issues? Because, you know, sometimes I wonder if a same sex couple, possibly one of those people identifies as a different kind of sex. What's, how do you address that as a priest when someone says, I feel like I'm a woman trapped in a man's body? Are there specific rules and guidelines around things like that? I mean, sir, there's, oh yeah, there's, you know, deeply theological um, convictions as to why the church believes what it does. Um, you know, first and foremost, though, is is to sit there and listen, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and to listen with understanding. Um, because if, if this person is bringing this up, it's because they want to be heard. You right. know, they want to be understood, um, you know, and so it's it's always to, you know, to to sit there and, and, and really be a non-anxious listener. 
you know, try to sit there, listen with understanding, you know, um, maybe ask facilitating questions, um, you know, to, to really understand what's going on in this person. Um, but how we develop like our theology behind this um, is, is steep in a lot of different things, you know, not just pure theology, but even philosophy, you know, um, when it comes to, like identity issues, and especially if we're talking about like, you know, transgenderism, things like that. Um, the church goes into a lot of, uh, we would say, philosophical anthropology that then also serves as a foundation to theological anthropology. So, you know, you have um, and, and I've taken classes on both, um, you know, talking about like, what does it mean to be? You know, what are we philosophically as human beings? Um, when you study anthropology, you're studying what what does it mean to be a man, anthropos man, you know, um, and not man in, in the sense of just male, but like man in the sense of human. Right. You know, so uh, I remember for philosophical anthropology, we go into like psychical tendencies, um, you know, the nature of being itself. Um, what what composes us, you know, and then theologically, uh, John Paul II was the one who really kind of. Uh, revolutionized theological anthropology when he gave his theology of the body catechesis. Um, and it's extensive. I mean, the original works, it's a series of talks he gave um, for several years. Uh, and so you can read the works and there's so many commentaries on them. Um, and he talks about, you know, what we are as human beings, meaning that, you know, we, we have a body, we are body and we are soul. It's not just that we have one or the other, but that we are each our body and our soul. They're both intimately part of our being. Um, not that we are our souls that have bodies. It's not like our body is an avatar. You know, my body is just as much a part of me and is my being as is my soul, right? It's both in the same. Um, and so that's what, that's kind of where our, our anthropology comes from uh, as Catholics um, is, is looking at the person in that way. And then from that, you know, looking at all these issues we have, like with identity, you know, um, perhaps like the psychology, the physiology behind it, you know, um, looking at things like hormone imbalances, you know, certainly we're not going to deny the science behind that. Um, but at the same time, we have to be realistic with, you know, um, it, it, we are our bodies just as much as we are our souls. Um, and so we have to take that into account, you know, so it, it's dicey. It really is. So that there's bi a lot of bi parte, areas. Is that what that that's, is that what the term is by parte? Uh, I'm not familiar with the biparte, but, you know, certainly it, it the word we would use at least is, you know, we, we are bodies just as much as we are our souls. That might be the is, word, but I, 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 that's not how it was portrayed in our classes. Or things is, like uh, is the soul genderless, do you think? No. So <laughs> let me, there's a clarification in this question because angels are pure spirit, right? Uh, angels are spirit, but they, they, they do not have body as we do, right? Mm. So um, when it comes to angels, because some people ask that too, do angels have genders? Um, no, they're simply spirit. For us as human beings, we derive our gender usually from the body we're attached to, right? It's the union of body and soul that determines gender of the entire being, right? Wow. So you can't have two genders, right? You're, so you, the, 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 the spiritual side is intimately connected to the physical, you know? And so that's where you do get into issues because um, people start to say, you know, like, um, like I have a, a a male spirit trapped in a female body or things like that. Well, no, our we the the spirit gets its gender from the body it's attached to. Because even in eternity, we maintain that. You know, when our when our soul separates from our body at death, we don't lose our gender because we're detached from our bodies until the resurrection. We maintain that gender because it was once attached to a body. Right. So that that there's always a relationship between the body, which is corruptible on this earth uh, versus the immortal soul. That's fascinating. Well, wow. yeah. yeah, very interesting. I love to take these deep dives on occasion with you and, <laughs> and hear this because it's always a really interesting uh, conversation. But oh, Father yeah. Dan, we're out of time. So I appreciate you coming out. <clears throat> um, everyone, I think we already talked at the top of the episode what's coming. Spanish language version of Jesus in the Dojo, audiobook version of Jesus in the Dojo, uh, Karate Priest coming back to the podcast sometime in the summer or the fall. Um, and who knows what else we'll get into this year. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. It's always been a pleasure. I think you all know by now where to uh, find him out, out there on the interweb. So definitely look his stuff up. And uh, until next time, Father Dan. Sounds good. Yep. Enjoy yeah. the cold weather. I'll try. <laughs> Take care. Have a good day. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. 
please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. Hi, everybody. I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and I host the podcast A Catholic's Perspective. Join me every two weeks as I release episodes targeted towards helping young Catholics navigate their ever-changing secular world while staying strong in their faith. Whether you are a Catholic or not, all are welcome here. So if this is something that interests you, feel free to tune in. You can find A Catholic's Perspective on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope to see you there. Bye! The No Earthly Explanation podcast investigates the things that are unexplainable. Hosted by world-renowned investigative researcher Donald R. Schmidt and scientist Ellie Ringo. Follow them as they look for evidence for things that have no earthly explanation. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.